Okay, so we welcome. Welcome again. Uh, my name is Katarzyna Persson. I'm a member of the Academic Committee of Bridging Divides, Rapture and Continuity in Polish Jewish History, which is a conference organized by us, by the Jewish Historical Institute, and uh, together with the Fortune of Video Archive for Holocaust Testimonies at Yale University and the Fish Center uh, for Holocaust and Geno uh, Genocide Studies at Yeshiva University. We are delighted to have you here, to have you in the Jewish Historical Institute. And the concept of the conference is really pretty straightforward, to bring you all here and to start and to continue discussion on uh, continuity or lack of continuity in uh, various aspects of Polish Jewish history and uh, Polish Jewish culture. And we'll be looking at completely new topics and we'll also be uh, looking, giving or looking anew at, at things which are now well researched. So this is all very exciting. And um, yes, yeah, so I'd just like to say thank you. Thank you for uh, submitting your papers. Thank you for coming here. Uh, thank you for uh, inspiring discussion to come. And I'm very much looking forward uh, to our conversations. And now I'd like to welcome Monika Krawczyk, who's director of the Jewish Historical Institute. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. And dear rabbis, professors, and distinguished scholars um, gathered here in Warsaw and also viewing us on the, via internet and who connect uh, with us from the whole world. So welcome. And uh, it's really great pleasure and privilege to, to welcome you here. And uh, it's... Uh, special place to be here in Jewish Historical Institute, the home of Onek Shabbat archive, which you can view on display some of the documents in original uh, on the first floor or the second floor, depends how you count, um, here in our institute. And we invite you to see those precious documents here. Um, this is a historical building that witnessed pre-war vibrant Jewish community. It was also part of the ghetto institutions and uh, it witnessed the destruction of the Great Synagogue of Warsaw on 16th of May 1943. Um, that great synagogue stood just opposite to our building where we are. And you can see here on the floor, there are marks of fire that was uh, raging here in this building when the um, Germans blew up the synagogue. And this is the remarkable and uh, durable witness to the history that we continue to tell uh, from generation to generation, remembering the magnitude of Holocaust and remembering the vi victims, but remembering also the bravery of, uh, and dignity of human spirit that was able to lift it up, the terrible experiences of the Holocaust. And uh, um, basically also enables us to uh, think and research, continue research on the, those subjects that are very, very important. Uh, it is our obligation to remember and to research the destruction of Holocaust that created such a great loss of a nation and contribute whatever and however we can and we may to prevent such developments. In too many cases, our efforts are not enough. The action is required. And we gather together in order to mark two special occasions. First of all, it's the commemoration of victims of 80th anniversary of German Aktion Reinhardt, uh, which was planned uh, and uh, deliberate annihilation of Jews of occupied Poland. Uh, that was renamed to general government by the, by the Germans. And second of all, it's also the 75th anniversary of establishment of Jewish Historical Institute, the institute that continues the research until today. 
It is rem remarkable to note that the downtrodden, desperate survivors who emerged from the abyss of the Shoah, who themselves were a glowing branch picked from a fire, immediately started historical research aimed to save the remnants of 2,000 years heritage of Jewish civilization in Europe, help their brothers and sisters and bring justice and retribution to war criminals. The documents and the testimonies collected here in the, in the Jewish Historical Institute by the Central Jewish Commission actually served in the major war uh, trials after the Second World War. Uh, this anniversary of 75th year marking establishment of Jewish Historical Institute uh, has been recognized by President of Poland, who sent us special address on this occasion, and it will be published on our website. Since it's in Polish, we will not, uh, could not make the full translation of it in a short time notice, but we are very grateful for this recognition of uh, our work of the Jewish Historical Institute, which is also the work of hundreds or may maybe thousands of scholars from all over the world who came here to research the uh, Shoah, the Holocaust, the Second World War, in the building where, where, it, where the documentation and research started by um, Dr. Emanuel Ringelblum and his Onek Shabbat group, which we consider today as a part of civilian resistance, uh, which, is not, which cannot be denied any importance. And they were partners of the ghetto fighters uh, further on in the history. Again, welcome, and we wish you to have successful conference. I would like to thank Katarzyna Persson, Glenn Diner, uh, Shai Pilnik, who were in the academic committee, and Steve Naron of Fortune of Archive for inspiration and supporting of the conference. I would like to welcome also distinguished guests, um, the, um, uh, Professor Andrzej Zbertowicz, who is the counsel of the uh, President of Poland, Thank you very much for coming. And uh, we would like to welcome the keynote speaker of uh, this evening, Professor Samuel Casso, who is the author of uh, amazing book that really shows in a, from brilliant perspective the magnitude of uh, Onek Shabbat group and uh, Manuel Ringelblum and his inspiration and I would like to welcome uh, from my whole heart Dr. Uh, Marian Turski, who is a Holocaust survivor, and further on, he's also representing the Association of Jewish Historical Institute, which is the partner of, uh, of, the, uh, of Zich, and uh, is very important moral, example for our generation. So thank you very much for coming. Uh, and I would like also to recognize uh, Dr. Uh, Professor uh, Eleonora Bergman, who is the former director of the Jewish Historical Institute. And uh, it was not enough for her to finish the full edition of 38 volumes of the documents of Emanuel Ringelblum on a Shabbat archive in Polish. So now she's on the task to uh, make a faithful translation of the uh, full documentation in, into English together with other scholars, among them Professor Katarzyna Persson. Thank you very much for this effort. And um, I guess it's over to Glenn. Say a few words. Thank you. Thank you so much, Monica. I, I'd just like to re-emphasize what Monica said, um, that this is really an occasion of marking tragedy, but also real joy, you know, the creation of Zich. 
And uh, in this short, uh, short introduction to the conference and then to our keynote speaker, I think I'm going to emphasize the joy part, the positivity, because that's really what we're trying to achieve here with our theme of bridging divides. Um, first and foremost, we owe a, a real debt of gratitude to our sponsors, that is Zhich uh, and uh, the government and the Yale Fortunoff Archive and the Fish Center at Yeshiva University. I think it's just a, a tremendous thing that we're able to bridge that geographical divide with uh, the help of our generous sponsors and to gather here today and to really you know, get feedback about our work um, from some generous senior scholars and as well as, uh, you know, Share, share the fruits of your research for us, which will be so, so gratifying. Um, I'd like to actually share an anecdote from a testimonial that's held in the Yale Fortunoff archives by a former Hasidic Holocaust survivor by the name of Moshe, who seems to encapsulate so much of what we're doing here today. He, uh, his life, you know, just runs the gamut. The pre-war, he's from a Hasidic family. He um, goes to work in a factory where he becomes radicalized and uh, joins the Communist Party, but then is, is repelled by Stalinist terror and eventually winds up as, I guess, a socialist Zionist living in Israel, and that's where he gives his testimony. The anecdote I want to share, though, is about the way he describes his town. His town, like many towns, was somewhat divided, you know, Jews and, and Catholic Poles. Um, there was a narrow bridge that joined the two parts of town, and the base medrash, the uh, study hall and the prayer hall, happened to be on the other side of the bridge. So when he was a child, Moshe and his father would have to cross that bridge to go to prayer, and it's a narrow bridge. And uh, one morning, they were crossing the bridge, and the, the biggest pole in the town, everyone was a little bit afraid of. He allegedly carried a huge knife with him, and he was scary. He's coming from the other side of the bridge. And so Moshe's father instinctively pulls him away you know, to make room for this imposing figure. And, uh, but Moshe's curious, and he tears away, and he just stands right in front of this huge man, and the man looks down at him and grabs him and gives him a hug and kisses him on the head and uh, then lets them pass. So what we have, instead of this you know, situation, this you know, complete binary division between Jews and Poles, is actually a moment of encounter. And that encounter turns out to be transformative, because from that point, Moshe decides he's not going to be so afraid of the other side of town. He goes and he asks for work in the mill. I think it's very heavy work. And they say, oh, well, do you want to be a bookkeeper? No, no, I don't want to be a bookkeeper. I want to be a laborer. I want to do the real work. And that's, of course, where he gets radicalized. Um, during the Holocaust, he joins the communist underground. He fights as a partisan in the forests. And that moment, in a sense, may have saved his life because it, it you know, put him on that trajectory towards, we could say, universalism. But then, of course, he's thrown back uh, by Stalin, I guess, you know, away from the radical universalism and, and onto his Jewish nationalism. Um, this, is, in a sense, is a metaphor. You know, it has a bridge. It has an encounter, and that's what we're trying to accomplish, not just geographically, but thematically. You know, we felt as we were organizing this conference um, that, uh, that there was a huge divide between Holocaust studies and the rest of Polish Jewish history. You know, it was very isolated. So we've asked participants to try to look for ways to bridge that divide. But there are many other divides as well. You know, there's... Um, there's the gender divide. Instead of just writing women's history or men's history as it used to be, you know, we look for points of encounter and mutual influence. The religious secular divide. You know, there isn't just a single secularism narrative that's a very complex, uh, transformative, mutually transformative encounter between the forces of tradition and what we co could call the forces of modernity. 
Um, other kinds of divides exist as well, of course, between Poles and Jews. Now, I just want to say a little bit about Zich itself. Uh, again, thanks so much to Monica and uh, Yulia for your hard work organizing this. When I first came to Poland, I was a graduate student, and I just want to express my gratitude for the way that the staff at Zich Jan Doktor, Lena Bergman, uh, Hanna Vincinik, who's not here right now, really, really just welcomed me and uh, essentially, you know, paved my way, you know, set me up with the archives, had me meet the archivists. Hanna Vincinik even helped me decipher documents, you know, it was, there was no formal connection there, just a natural welcoming atmosphere that I think is just so incredibly valuable because it's intimidating, you know, coming from another country and coming to Poland. You don't know what to expect. It was my first time. So this was really a home for me here. Um, and uh, I want to emphasize to the holdings here at Zich, which are just so rare, unique, and valuable. Artifacts, original works of art, paintings, you know, religious implements, what these objects do, they, they contain a certain kind of vitality, a certain kind of meaning that's absolutely irreplaceable. You know, that allows you to encounter the past. So the last kind of divide I think I'd like to address is bridging that divide between the present and the past, which I think you'll find that the uh, rich holdings of the uh, Zich archives and art collections and everything else you know, allows you to bridge just uh, you know, between the present and the past. Um, we are extremely fortunate to have as our keynote, Professor Sam Cassow, the uh, Northern Professor of History at Trinity College, also, as you heard, author of the fabulous book, Who Will Write Our History. We really felt that Sam encapsulates so much of what we're talking about, where you know, he treats the before, during, and after of the Holocaust in his work, um, secular movements, religious movements, Jewish culture really as a, as a holistic uh, kind of a construct, not as some sort of false binary, um, and, you know, he just brings it all together so beautifully in his work. There was a film made uh, that we're going to see of Who Will Write Our History that I'm really excited about because I haven't gotten to see it yet. It's actually a little bit difficult to, to get your hands on. So we have a real treat with that, too. Um, and I should mention Sam's enormously important work on the Pauline Museum, the 19th century exhibit, and uh, also just his generosity in helping scholars from Poland and other parts of Eastern Europe, uh, I guess, uh, Eastern East Central Europe, uh, just uh, you know, really, really introducing them to the Western world and giving them all kinds of opportunities and promoting their work and supporting their work. So Sam is really, I think, uh, a, a true role model for us, and it's my, my real pleasure and honor to be able to introduce him. Thanks. Thank you, Glenn, for that very nice uh, introduction. And uh, thank you uh, to the Zich, uh, to the Jewish Historical Institute, Madame Director. And I'm especially happy to see Dr. Tursky here. And of course, all those who've made this uh, conference uh, possible. Uh, since uh, uh, Glenn was telling some anecdotes, I, I want to share a personal anecdote, which I wasn't planning to tell, that uh, my uh, parents both came from little towns in what the Poles would call the Kresy, uh, near Vilna. And uh, my mother always used to tell me that uh, they really didn't know any Poles and had nothing to do with the Poles in the town. But in the mid-80s at the Evo, I found the town newspaper. It was a weekly newspaper. And uh, it was a revelation. Uh, ads for King Kong and for Captains Courageous, ads in Yiddish for King Kong, Kumsetat Stansik Metodige Malpe, and uh, 
my mother's mother, my grandmother, had a restaurant, and on Saturday nights they moved the chairs and people came to watch movies. The Poles, the White Russians, the Jews all sat together to watch the movies. And uh, I was told that in 1939, they were told that they would get two films soon. One was Avec mit dem Wind, Gone with the Wind, and the other was Der Kishef Macher von Oz, the, the uh, Wizard of Oz, of course, other events interfered, and the movies were never shown. But my mother told me that they didn't know many Poles. But then in this newspaper, I found the edition of March 1936, and my mother's sister, Dina, got married. And the whole front page was taken up with congratulation advertisements, and most of the congratulations were from Poles and not from Jews, and they were in Polish. And I asked my mother, what is this? You said you didn't know any Poles. And her words are much more significant than they seem. Her response was, I forgot. <laughs> Think about that. I forgot. Anyway, I'm very uh, gratified to have a chance to uh, honor the memory of Emanuel Ringelblum and the work he did in the very building that he spent so much of his time in the Warsaw Ghetto, in the very building where many important scholars of Polish Jewry at some time or another taught and wrote, the building of the Institut Nauk Judeistycznych, Meyer Balaban, Moses Schor, Isaac Schipper, and were after the war, under less than ideal conditions, scholars of the Zich, of the Jewish Historical Institute, tried to continue the traditions of Polish Jewish scholarship. Bear Mark, who had his issues, but he deserves mention, and special mention to Arthur Eisenbach, who was Ringelblum's um, uh, brother-in-law, Tatiana Berenstein, and of course, Ruta Sakowska, who did more than anyone else to study and arrange the Oynik Shabbos archive and make it possible for other scholars, including myself, to write about Emanuel Ringelblum. Among the many reasons why it's important for us to remember uh, Ringelblum's work, there are some specific issues which I'd like to highlight at this forum where there are many younger scholars who are just starting their careers. First, I think it's no exaggeration to say that Ringelblum believed that it was just as important for historians to facilitate the work of colleagues as it was to write their own monographs. It was important to organize seminars, conferences, compile bibliographies, encourage lay people to write the history of their towns. And in writing the history of their towns, in photographing local uh, cemeteries, in collecting folklore, it was important to remember that those towns were not just Jewish towns, that Poles and white Russians and Ukrainians also lived there. Doing history for Ringelblum was outreach. It was a collective task. One might say even a kind of community building. From the Junger Historica Kreis, which he organized with Rafael Mahler, to the Yivo Historical Commission, to the Oynik Shabbos Archive, Ringelblum never forgot the importance of teamwork and organization. One observer writing in the 1950s in Yediot Yad Vashem, Meyer Kozhin remarked, I think rather churlishly, that Ringelblum was more of a workhorse than an original thinker. I'll leave it to others to decide whether that's true or not, I disagree. But one thing I can state with confidence, a Balaban or a shipper would never have organized the Oynik Shabbos archive. It was Ringelblum who did it. Another point I want to make 
is how the Oynik Shabbos archive uh, addresses the relationship between Jewish history and Holocaust history, concerns highlighted by David Engel in his important book, The Holocaust and Jewish Historians. Engel asked why so many Jewish historians saw a divide between Holocaust scholarship and Jewish history, as if they were two separate fields. Reviewers of Engel's book, like Guy Miron and Alexandra Garbarina, suggested that cultural history is one way to bridge that divide. And they cited my work on Ringelblum, among others, as examples of how to do this. And not surprisingly, I agree. Whether we're talking about the Oynik Shabbos archive or the ghettos of Nazi-occupied Poland, we must remember continuities as well as rupture. Just as ghettos were not mere antechambers to the camps, but Jewish communities in their own right, still bound by myriad links with pre-war culture and values, communities battered but not yet destroyed, so too was the Oynik Shabbos archive linked to key developments like Dubnov's 1891 appeal to Zamel to collect documents, the collection of documents in order to fix the writing and reading of history as a new pillar of Jewish consciousness, linked to Shin Ansky's expedition through the Pale, linked to Peretz's warning in 1915 that Jews should not leave the writing of their history to their enemies linked to Cherry Cover's Pogrom archive, linked to the YIVO, linked to the Lankentnish movement of the 1920s and 1930s. All pillars of that secular, that new secular Yiddish culture to which Ringelblum had dedicated his energies before the war. As a young man, he had watched it flourish, and he was barely middle-aged, when he saw it destroyed. The whole era was measured in a few years. And as he witnessed its destruction, he saw it as a sacred duty to guard the memory of the writers, poets, and artists who died by composing dozens of vignettes written in his hideout on uh, Groyetska. Another observation, those of us who study the history of Polish Jewry have doubtless noticed lately a growing interest in material culture in Jewish space. We see it in recent work by Barbara Mann, Marcin Wojcicki, Cecile Kuznets, and, and others. And here too, we should remember that Ringa Bloom cared very deeply about these issues before the war. And as the Oynik Shabbos questionnaires show during the war itself, in a letter that he wrote to Adolf Berman, probably in September or October 1943, Ringelblum noted the German determination to wipe out the physical traces of Jewish life, old synagogues, cemeteries, and libraries. And I quote what he's writing now. I'm quoting directly. History knows of no other example where the enemy has been so determined to wipe out every trace of the vanquished. After the Romans destroyed Jerusalem, they left the Wailing Wall. After the barbarians invaded Rome, they left everywhere the material traces of Roman culture. The Muslim invaders, after they captured Christian Spain, turned churches into mosques. But what the Germans have done to Jewish cultural antiquities has no precedent in history. There may be some hyperbole here, but that's what he thought. Little wonder then that in the very, literally, in the very last days of his life, he was so worried about the fate of the archive. On March 1st, 1944, just a few days before he was <laughs> apprehended by the Germans, Ringelblum wrote to Adolf Berman, if we're caught, what will happen to the OS? What will happen to the Oynik Shabbos archive? He had good reason to worry because of the 60 or so collaborators that he brought into the archive. There were only 
three survivors. And uh, of those th three survivors, only Hirschwasser really knew where the archive was. And another one of those survivors, uh, Rachel Auerbach, noted rather mordantly after the war, we had better luck saving documents than we had saving people. The story of how much of the archive was discovered under the rubble of the Warsaw Ghetto was well known, and the Sheikh played a very important role in that story. One cache in September 1946, a second cache in, De in December 1950. Was there a third cache near the Chinese embassy? Who knows, open question. We know that many documents were ruined, much was probably lost forever, and yet we have an enormous treasure trove of materials, which thank to the uh, scholars of the Zich, uh, Lena, Lena Bergman, Katarzyna Persson, uh, uh, Andrzej Zbikowski, Tadeusz Epstein, and others have now been published, and now they're going to be published, or at least much is going to be published in English. And it's those documents that speak to the title that I chose for my book, Who Will Write Our History? Just before he was murdered in Majdanek in 1943, the historian Isaac Shipper, one of Ringelblum's key mentors, remarked, and I quote, what we know about murdered peoples is usually what their killers choose to say about them. What we know about murdered peoples is usually what their killers choose to say about them. But Ringelblum was determined to ensure that posterity would write the history of the Jews on the basis of Jewish and not German documents. Realizing that one could fight with paper and pen as well as guns, Ringelblum created an archive that was an important example of cultural resistance. Even from beyond the grave, the buried time capsules would serve future historians and also bring the perpetrators to justice. Had this archive disappeared, had this archive never been found, historians would have been dependent on German documents, various Polish sources, and a few survivor memoirs. Scholars could have investigated the development of German occupation policy. They might have traced Polish attitudes towards the Jews but they could have written little of value about the inner life of the Jews themselves. The murdered Jews of Poland, the murdered Jews of Warsaw, would have remained a mass of anonymous victims without names, without identity, without a record of what little agency they may have possessed. Of course, survivors would have written their memoirs and given their testimonies. But those accounts would have reflected what they knew after the event not Jewish voices in real time. The testimony of those who survived mass murder was quite different from the words of those who still did not know the final outcome, who were writing in real time, who were living in communities that were not yet, not yet destroyed. Beginning in the 1970s, many superb studies have appeared about various aspects of Warsaw Jewry in World War II. Uh, Ruta Sakowska, Israel Gutman, uh, uh, Javi Dreyfus, Jacek Liochak, Basha Engelking, Katarzyna Persson, Leah uh, Price, Andrzej Zbikowski, the more controversial but still useful monograph of Gunnar Paulson. Without the Ringelblum archive, it's hard to see how many of these books could have been written? Without the archive, what would we have known about the inner life of the ghetto, social conflicts, folklore, Jewish reactions to the tightening Nazi vice, the attitude of intellectuals, religious life, economic conditions, resistance, the underground press, the sermons of the Kasechna Rebbe? Of course, there were other ghetto archives in Lodz, Wuj, Bialystok, Vilno. But the Oynik Shabbos was the biggest and the most elaborate in all of Nazi-occupied Europe. It was a real collective. Ringelblum brought together 
in that group of 60 or so rabbis, communists, the famous, the not so famous men, women. Heading the archive was an organizational committee that set goals, raised money, charted strategy, decided who to co-opt. There were two key secretaries, Hirsch Wasser and Eliyahu Gutkowski, and they were the links between the executive committee and the rest of the staff. There were interviewers who gathered information from refugees to find out what was happening outside of Warsaw. You think interviewing is a routine job, it wasn't, because they had to go into refugee centers and expose themselves to the pandemic of uh, typhus, and several died. There were copiers who tried to make handwritten copies of the various documents. There was the so-called technical staff, Israel Lichtenstein and two uh, teenage boys, who had physical possession of the documents and the materials. And the archive was never discovered by the Germans. The secrecy held. The Oynik Shabbos, I think, could only have been possible in a ghetto like Warsaw which unlike the Lodge ghetto, which was tightly regimented, the Warsaw ghetto had the necessary social space. There were 1,200 house committees, even more. The house committees were the foundations of a unique organization called the Alain Hill for the self-help, which ran soup kitchens, refugee centers, schools, thanks to Ringelblum that made a point of employing the ghetto intelligentsia. The Alain Hilf worked under the cover of the American Joint Distribution Committee, and that gave it some protection from the Germans, at least until Pearl Harbor in December 1941. The Alain Hilf facilitated the work of the archive. It could fold expenses into the Alain Hilf budget, and most importantly, the archive could gather information and conduct interviews under the guise of welfare work. The archive also differed from the other ghetto archives in the sheer ambition of its agenda. Number one, to zamel, to collect diaries, essays, candy wrappers, doorbell instructions, menus, reflecting Ringelblum's pre-war interest in Alltagsgeschichte, the history of everyday life, and his pre-war interest in material culture. And then in 1941, the archive established a new agenda item, a comprehensive study of Jewish society in Poland under the Nazi occupation. And the executive committee drew up 80 topics, corruption, German-Jewish relations, Polish-Jewish relations, religious life, youth, women, so on. Each topic had a team leader to draw up guidelines, questionnaires to guide interviewers. Some members of the Oynik Shabbos staff headed three or four different topics. Now this was 1941. This was before the knowledge of the final solution. Ringelblum was thinking about Polish Jewry after the war, how Jews could use the lessons of the war to reflect on mistakes, to create a usable past, to show Jewish resilience, and at the same time to, to show Jewish loyalty to Poland and the Jewish role in the defense of Poland. And such a study clearly reflected the impact of the YIVO, the Yiddish Scientific Institute. Ringelblum and most members of the YIVO had been members of the executive committee before the war. And the YIVO spirit of applied research in the service of the Jewish people informed the Oynik Shabbos study project. Max Weinreich, the director of the EVO, said, Wissen schafft, knowledge creates. Knowledge is a weapon. Knowledge makes us strong, and the Oynik Shabbos hoped that it was this knowledge that it was gathering that would make Polish Jewry stronger after the war. The study was slated to run to 1,600 pages, and it was in full swing when the liquidation of the ghetto began in July 1942. And the secretaries told everybody to hand in their unfinished notes, and they were all buried in the first cache of the archive in August 1942. With the beginning of the final solution in Warsaw in July 1942, 
The Oynik Shabbos now, unfortunately, had a new agenda item, to document mass murder, to prepare evidence for indicting the killers after the war. The summer of 1942 was a summer where the 60 became 50, became 40, became 30. That summer, Ringelblum's handwriting changed. He did not write whole sentences. There were only random jottings. Ringelblum himself was torn between his obligations to the archive and his natural fear and his natural sense as a father and a husband to save his wife and child. The Einik Shabbos was under terrible strain. There were mutual recriminations. But Ringelblum pulled himself together and the archive kept on working. And you might ask why. Their world was collapsing all around them. Why did they stay at it? I believe a partial answer can be found in an unfinished essay by Gustava Yaretska, who was a stenographer in the Judenrat, and Ringelblum believed that her Judenrat pass might allow her to walk through the streets and write down what she saw. And Yaretska began an amazing essay, which was unfinished. She and her children ended up in Treblinka. But in part of this essay, Yaretska writes, how could you blame us Jews for having thought that the history of mankind is a story of moral progress from barbarism to decency? How could we have known that in the middle of the 20th century, the most cultured nation in Europe would be killing children? But if in fact the wheel of history is moving from decency to barbarism, then I hope that someday if my writings are found, that they might, and I quote her directly, that they might throw a stone under history's wheel. They might throw a stone under history's wheel. That someday people would read what she's writing and they say, oh my God, how could we have allowed such a terrible thing to happen? Let's make sure that such a monstrosity never takes place in the world again, never again. In 1942, one escapee from Chelmno, several escapees from Treblinka reached the Warsaw Ghetto. They were taken in hand and interviewed by the Oynik Shabbos. One interview alone of Arvim Shapitsky, who'd escaped from Treblinka, ran to over 100 typewritten pages in Yiddish. This was taken down by Rachel Auerbach. On the basis of this material and other eyewitness accounts of mass murder in the provinces, the Oynik Shabbos, working, I believe, with the Bund and using the channels of the Polish underground, sent four reports to the Polish underground government in London in the course of 1942. The Polish underground government turned those reports over to the British and to the Americans. Uh, the last report was so detailed that it included a map of Treblinka, even as Treblinka was killing 10,000 people a day. When the lull in the killing began in September 1942, the Oynik Shabbos resumed its study of the 50 or 60,000 Jews left in the ghetto. It traced the massive shift in Jewish psychology that started in September 42. It gathered material to help future historians understand what Javi um, Adreyfus has been writing about. Why was it that whereas in Vilna and in Bialystok, the, the Jews in the ghetto did not support an armed uprising. In the Warsaw ghetto, a situation developed where there was not only mass support for an armed uprising, but without that mass civilian support, the building of 750 bunkers, the uprising would not have taken place. That psychological shift is very, very uh, 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 much at at the top of Ringelblum's concerns, and had there been a third cache, as Hirschwasser says there was, as others say there wasn't, but had there been an, a third cache, we would have known even more about this. Now, Ringelblum kept on insisting, right, W-R-I-T-E, right now, 
Schreiben und verschreibe auf der heißer Minute. Write everything down immediately. Don't wait till tomorrow. You don't know if you'll be around tomorrow. You don't know if something terrible will happen to you to turn you into a different person. Everything you see, write it down immediately because Ringelblum as a trained historian understood the key difference between contemporaneous testimony and survivor memory. Jews giving evidence to the Oynik Shabbos were still part of a living community. The ghetto was not a concentration camp. It was still affected by pre-war norms. And the hopes, the fears, the fight for survival was a different kind of historical material than the recollections of survivors who'd gone through the camps. Let's take one example, Cecilia Slapakova, who was tasked by Ringelblum with studying women under the Nazi occupation. And she did an amazing job and described the psychological resilience of Jewish women, how as time went on, the, the uh, a burden of keeping the soup kitchens and the daycare centers and the self-help going fell more and more on the shoulders of women, how men were more prone to depression than women were. She writes that after the war, the Jewish woman will not let herself be pushed back into the kitchen, and she did not survive. But suppose she had survived, and suppose that in the 70s or 80s she was giving her testimony to the Spielberg archive. Would she have even remembered that once upon a time she was waxing lyrical about Jewish women in the Warsaw Ghetto? She probably would have forgotten like my mother forgot about the Poles. Or she would have seen the ghetto as a mere holding pen for the camps and nothing more. And Ringelblum, the historian, understood this. And thanks to him, in the archive, we see the different voices of Polish Jewry on the eve of destruction. The children's essays from the different ghetto schools written in Polish, Hebrew, and Yiddish. What I want to do when the war is over. The sermons of the Piasechner Rebbe, the protocol written by an ordinary Jewish woman uh, about the meeting of her house committee, the writings of Peretz Opachinsky, the ghetto mailman, a, an amazing searing account written by the Yiddish writer Shia Perla. Shia Perla wrote an essay called Chuv Mvausha, The Destruction of Warsaw. And in one incident he describes, he describes how a Jewish policeman is dragging a little five-year-old boy and he's dragging him to his SS handler. He had to deliver so many heads a day to save his skin or so he thought. He says, here's my fifth head of the day. And the SS man draws out a pistol, shoots the little boy and tells the Jewish policeman, this little dog doesn't count, go get me an adult and the policeman scampers off to get an adult. And Perla comes back and he's so furious, he's so angry that he writes, how could the Jewish people produce such scum as the Jewish police? And then he writes, perhaps a people that produces such scum is a people that deserves what it's getting. Now, let's say that Perla had survived the war, had not been murdered in Auschwitz in October 1943. He, I don't believe he ever would have written this. And uh, this underscores a key difference between wartime Jewish writing and post-war Jewish writing. Wartime Jewish writing, the kind of writing you see in the Ring of Blue Market, is marked by a much higher degree of Jewish anger directed against other Jews. Jewish bitterness deepened by a sense of national disaster unmitigated by any shred of hope except maybe, kind of, sort of, the imminent arrival of the Red Army. There was betrayal everywhere. There was no certainty that there would be a state of Israel. There was seemed to be no comfort, no consolation. If you read the writings of Abraham Levin or Yitzhak Katz Nelson, they're aware that the most vital part of the Jewish nation, Polish Jewry, 
is going under, and they're asking, can the Jewish people survive the destruction of Polish Jewry? Now, back to Ringelblum. When he reads Perilous Chum Vausche, he could easily have ripped it up. It doesn't make Jews look very good. But he included this. He put it into the milk can. It was found in the second cache of the archive. Tell the whole story, the bad with the good. Objectivity, or as much objectivity as possible to achieve, will bolster the legitimacy of the archive in the eyes of future historians. And Ringelblum at this point, between September 42 and April 43, was doing a lot of thinking, a lot of back and forth. Many Jewish intellectuals in the Warsaw Ghetto, responding to Onib Shabbos questionnaires, had believed that even before the war, the Jewish people had been in a state of decline and galloping corruption that the demoralization and corruption in the ghetto was only a continuation of what had already started. That the medieval Jew had the fortress, the protection of religion and faith. The modern secular Jew was caught between two shores, unable to believe in God, unable to find acceptance by the non-Jewish world. And this doubled the tragedy. And Ringelblum struggled with this. And then he comes to a conclusion, and he says, by and large, the Jews passed the moral test, that the Jews were not any more corrupt than other peoples. And Ringelblum writes that future historians, if they carefully look at the evidence of the archive, will see a story that a superficial reading will miss, that under, it's like a boiling kettle, that underneath the top of the kettle where the water is seething and that top layer is the Jewish police, the demoralization, the corruption, the bottom layer are those hundreds of thousands of Jews in the Warsaw Ghetto who tried to keep their dignity, who tried to keep their neighbors and their families alive, who resisted in their own way. These were ordinary Jews with no money, no contacts, no hope of survival. They went to their deaths, but in Ringelblum's mind, this is what he called the stille Heldentum von dem Jüdischen Massenmensch, the quiet heroism of the ordinary Jew. This was the real story of the ghetto. And if the price to pay for getting that story across was to include accounts like Perla's description of the Jewish police, that was a price that was uh, worth paying. Now, I'm sure that many of you know by this time who Ringelblum was. When just before the war began, he was in Switzerland at a Zionist Congress. He went back when he could have stayed. Uh, other leaders were running away from Warsaw. When Ringelblum comes in the height of the bombardment and the siege, Ringelblum says not everybody can run. Somebody has to stay to organize relief. Now, the war tested people. The great were often exposed and found wanting, while catastrophe raised other people to new heights. Ringelblum may have been remembered as kind of a run-of-the-mill activist, run-of-the-mill historian before the war, maybe. But it was during the war that he rose to greatness as a community leader and as a historian. He was born in Buchac, in Galicia, 1900. Uh, as a Litvak, it pains me to say that when it comes to the writing of history, the Galicianers have a monopoly. Baron, Mahler, Ringelblum, Balaban, Schipper. He came of age in interwar Poland, where he faced the status of being a second-class citizen. And like other Jewish youth, Ringelblum was looking for a way out. He was looking for an anchor, a psychological anchor to combat pariah status and growing economic uh, discrimination. And so Ringelblum wore 
three different hats. The first hat was politics. He joins the Linke Poilitzion, the left labor Zionists. There are jokes about the right wing of the left Poilitzion and the left wing of the left Poilitzion, and this is true. And don't get me started about a party that wanted a binational socialist Soviet Yiddish-speaking Palestine. I'm still trying to figure that out. But anyway, this is not the time to talk about this. The week that Ringelblum turned 17, two things happened. The Balfour Declaration and the November Revolution. And some young Jews of his generation looked to salvation in Jerusalem. Some looked to salvation in Moscow. Ringelblum joined a movement that combined a pro-Soviet orientation with Zionism. The road to Jerusalem leads through Moscow. And Ringelblum was shaped by the intellectual legacy of a man he never met, Ber Borachov. He had enormous respect for him. There's a story that uh, when the party commemorated Borachov's yard site, it always happened in January, and it was very cold, 20 below zero, and Ringelblum got too late to get into the hall, and they would lock the hall because communists would come in to disrupt the meetings. And instead of going home, Ringelblum stood at attention during the whole meeting, freezing his nose. And the party members left the meeting, said, why are you standing there like a Galen? Why didn't you go home? He said, this is the punishment I took upon myself for being late to honor the memory of Ber Borachov. Now, Borachov provided young Marxists like Ringelblum with the intellectual tools to confront and correct the left's um, a blind spot when it came to Jews, a blind spot which still exists in any American university where you have to fight the victims of all oppression and all discrimination, and everybody deserves self-determination except Jews. And this was a condescension encouraged by the writings of Marx and Lenin. And one of the key goals of the Linke Poilitzion was how do you put Jews back on the intellectual radar screen of the left? And one way of doing this is to write a historical record that would show the reality of Jewish peoplehood, not just in the capitalist and the feudal past, but to defend Jewish peoplehood after the revolution and to fight back against Marx and Lenin, who say that the Jews are a mere ephemeral, ephemeral caste in capitalism that will disappear with the revolution. This discipleship of Borachov encouraged the study of Jewish economic and social history. And it also encouraged a deep devotion to Yiddish culture and to the Jewish masses in Poland, a devotion which Ringelblum transformed into ongoing activities, teaching Jewish workers, going to summer camps, uh, propagating the study of the uh, Jewish history in Poland for the Jewish masses. Jewish political parties in Poland had no hope of power, clearly. But that was your family. That's where you met your friends. It was in the party that Ringelblum met his wife, Judita. They had one son, Yuri, who was the apple of their eye. An another story. I tracked down a student who had been Ringelblum's uh, student at the uh, Yehudia High School in Warsaw, where <coughs> Ringelblum taught. And uh, Ringelblum was not known as the best teacher. It was a high school for spoiled, many middle-class Jewish girls. Some were, came from very wealthy families, whatever. And this student told me that when the girls decided that they didn't want to take an exam that was scheduled on a, on a particular day, one would be delegated to raise her hand. And Ringelblum would say yes, and the girl would say, uh, 
Dr. Ringelblum, we're just curious. You, you haven't talked about your son in so long. Is he okay? Is he sick? <laughs> we're, we're just asking. Oh, well, and he pulls out his wallet. He shows pictures. He brags about what Yuri is doing. The girls ask more questions. The class goes on and on. The bell rings, and they have more time to study for the exam. Anyway, that was the first hat that Ringel Bloom wore, politics. The second hat was as a community organizer. Begins to work for the Joint Distribution Committee in 1931. Helps to organize microcredit societies. The loans were small, but Ringel Bloom, working together with Yitzhak Gitterman, and that collaboration continued in the Oynik Shabbos archive. He became totally convinced of the moral and national significance of self-help. And not only that, but the interplay between community organizing, self-help, and the doing of history. That the way to get material from ordinary Jews is to be a community organizer, to establish the contacts, and then you could find out about their lives. Now, the third hat Ringel Blue Moore was as a historian. He got his PhD in history from Warsaw University under the supervision of Professor Marcelli Handelsmann. No hope of an academic career, but Jewish historians in Poland, and Natalia Alexian has written about this, saw themselves not just as scholars, but as fighters, that history was a vital weapon in the Jewish fight for equal rights in the Second Republic. Polish historians like Roman Rybarski were writing thick tomes to show that the Jews were aliens, that they had kept Poland from developing a middle class, that they had stymied the development of Polish cities, that they had set Poland up for the partitions. Jewish historians had to fight back, and in their thick tomes, show that Jews were rooted in Poland. They had helped build the economy. They'd fought for Polish independence. And they were here by right and not on sufferance. As a Marxist, and as a convinced Marxist, Ringelblum fought back against the idea that the Polish people were naturally and inevitably anti-Semitic. He couldn't believe that. He blamed anti-Semitism in Poland on manipulation by the church, by political elites, on the dysfunctions of the economic system. But he believed that the historian could build bridges to the Poles, that the Jewish historian could get Poles to look at their Jewish neighbors in a new light as real people, not as an undifferentiated other. The historian was not only a fighter on the Polish street, he was a fighter on the Jewish street. Ringelblum wanted to give the Jews a new sense of who they were. The history of Jews was not a story of rabbis and scholars, of rich and poor Jews harmoniously walking to shul to pray on Shabbos. As Schipper said, we have spent too much time studying the Shabbos Jew. It's now time to study the Jew of the week, the Jew of everyday work, the forgotten Jews, the uh, ordinary people, the women, the beggars, the uh, apprentices. Now, interwar Polish Jewry had a keen interest in Jewish history. Balaban and Chipper had regular columns in the Jewish press, novels like Joseph Opatoshu's In Pelisha Velder or Sholomash's Kiddush Hashem were bestsellers. Historical scholarship, even if it concerned the 17th and 16th century, spoke to contemporary conflicts in a deeply divided and fractious Jewish community. Internal Jewish battles, religion versus secularism, Yiddish versus Hebrew, Zionism versus diaspora nationalism, was the Council of the Four Lands, were the Kehilot of the Old Commonwealth, were they guardians of national unity, as Dubnov said, or were they organs of class exploitation, as Rafael Mahler said? Could religion take credit for Jewish survival over the centuries? 
as Yecheskel Kaufman says? Or should one look to economic factors, as Ringelblum and Mahler said? Was Yiddish culture a recent byproduct of political radicalism, or was it rooted in a centuries-old popular culture? Ringelblum was very aware, he was very self-aware, that as a politically engaged Marxist, he faced a tension inherited from Dubnov, a tension between Jewish history as scholarship and Jewish history as nation building. Also a tension between Jewish history as a weapon of national defense and Jewish history as shallow, lame apologetics. Ringelblum himself said that historians like him had to steer between Scylla and uh, Charybdis. And uh, he tried to do the best he could, even though it would be a mistake to say that politics played no role in his writings in the Oenik Shabbos. Now, for a very long time, Ringelblum refused to believe that the final solution would totally destroy Polish Jewry. In June 1942, he listens to a BBC broadcast, and he says, this is a great day for the Oynik Shabbos. What's the great day? 700,000 Polish Jews have been murdered. Why is that so great? Because 700,000 is the number that the Oynik Shabbos put in its last report. And Ringelblum now knew that those reports were being tr transmitted by the Polish underground to the London government. And it was being uh, given to the BBC. And Ringelblum now was telling himself, all those millions of Germans who not so long ago had voted for the SPD and the communists, now we will hear from them. The ordinary German soldier in the Wehrmacht, when he knows about this crime being committed in his name, he might force Hitler to stop. By the way, this is also something said by Peretz Opachinsky, another member of the Oenig Shabbos. Of course, that didn't happen. But it shows you his refusal to give up his basic belief in the decency of ordinary people. On the fourth day of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, he was caught by the Germans, sent to the Travniki labor camp, and sure enough, Ringelblum being Ringelblum, even in the Travniki labor camp, he began what would have been the first study of Jewish life in a concentration camp. Social conflicts, humor, sexual relations, that manuscript was actually lost. And then he made a daring escape, uh, uh, escape which I describe in my book, and he arrives in a bunker on Grajetska Street in the south part of Warsaw, including many Jews and his wife and son, maintained by a Polish family with Jewish funds. Because two denizens of the bunker escaped, we know what it was like. The fetid air, the fear, the tension, the overcrowding, the constant squabbles, the quarrels, and Ringelblum just sat in a corner, ignoring everything, writing by the light of a carbide lamp, writing literally thousands of pages. He could have escaped with his wife and child to Hungary in December 43, but he refused. He was engaged in his final mission, to write about the Jewish intelligentsia, about the Yiddish cultural elite, about the problems of Jewish resistance, and his masterpiece, Polish-Jewish relations. When he began to write his book on Polish-Jewish relations, you could tell that he felt a sense of crushing, crushing responsibility. An 800-year history of two peoples living side by side in the same land was coming to an end in a cloud of bitterness and anger. 
He didn't know that Philip Friedman was still alive. He believed he was the only Jewish historian left in Poland, and he had to get it right. And so this left-wing Marxist writes an introduction where he compares himself to a cipher, to a scribe writing a Sefer Torah, a Torah scroll. And if you write a Sefer Torah, you can't make a mistake, and you have to go to a mikveh, you have to go to a ritual bath to purify yourself, and the slightest mistake will render the manuscript impure. Now, Ringelblum always despised stereotypes. And one stereotype that he especially hated was the stereotype that all Poles hated Jews. And he says, the stereotype that all Poles are happy that Jews are being killed, that's not true. Even as I write this, Poles are risking their lives to help us, and I've been helped in the past by other Poles. But, and remember, that even as late as uh, early 1943, Ringelblum could write, and I'm now quoting directly, there was a widespread opinion among Jews that anti-Semitism has increased sharply during the time of the war, and that most Poles are happy about the misfortunes that have beset Jews in the cities and small towns of Poland. But the attentive reader of our materials will find hundreds of documents which show the opposite. In more than one report from a shtetl, he will read about how warmly the Polish population treated Jewish refugees. You will find hundreds of examples of peasants hiding and feeding Jewish refugees from nearby shtetlech. But by the time he was writing Polish-Jewish relations, he had seen much more. He had seen too much. He could not ignore the evidence of betrayal, and he could not ignore the anger that Jews had come to feel towards Poles, an anger which confirms Javi Dreyfus's thesis of a sharp change for the worse in Jewish perception of Poles with the beginning of mass murder. Now, Ringelblum went out of his way to try to get it right. He underscored the difficulties and the dangers that Poles faced who tried to save Jews. And in fact, a Pole who tried to help my mother, and he became a, I got him, I helped get him an award of righteous Gentile, he faced terrible danger. He admitted that. He also underscored the fact that it was the Germans and not the Poles who began the Holocaust. He underscored the fact that the Germans were so determined to kill every Jew that even if the Poles became angels, unless the war ended soon, most Jews would die anyway. He paid tribute to the heroism and patriotism of the Polish people, the courage they showed in resisting the Germans. But then he asked this, why was it that not long ago, I heard that when the Germans were pursuing a fleeing Polish resistance fighter in the streets of Warsaw, all they had to yell was, catch the Jew. And Polish passerby rushed to help the Germans catch this fleeing Polish fighter. Why was it, Ringelblum asked, that as the Jews looked through the cracks of the trains taking them to Treblinka, they saw the self-contented smirk of their Polish neighbors? It was a story of isolation, of lack of moral support. He believed that the Polish underground state had almost entirely abdicated its responsibility to fellow Citizen. different. Now, when Ringelblum wrote this, his information was very limited. He certainly didn't know about Yedvabne, for example. Thanks to the scholarship of Jan Gross, Pasha Engelking, Jan Grabowski, and others, we now know much more, going far beyond what Ringelblum was writing in the last weeks of his life. You all know how it ended the betrayal, the discovery of the bunker. The Jews and uh, the Polish gardener 
were taken to the Paviak uh, uh, prison. And uh, a Jewish journalist who was in the Paviak prison when Ringelblum and the other Jews arrived uh, recalls how the prisoners were hoping that maybe they could save Ringelblum. And maybe they could bribe one of the guards, get Ringelblum out of that cell, get Ringelblum out of that cell, take him into another cell, save his life. Here shout. Yechiel Hershout goes into Ringelblum's cell, outlines the scheme. Ringelblum asks about his wife and child. Hershout shakes his head, we can't do anything for them. Ringelblum says, no, I won't leave them. And the last words that he remembers Ringelblum saying, he's saying this in Yiddish, he's pointing to his son who's sitting on his lap. And Ringelblum's been badly beaten. Clearly, he went through a very tough interrogation. Ringelblum asks in Yiddish, Why is this little one guilty? What did he do? My heart is breaking because of him. On March 10th, the Jews and the Pole who maintained the hideout were shot by the Germans. And as we know, at least 750 Poles were executed for what the Germans call Judenbegunstigung, or helping Jews. I want to end this talk by going back to August 3rd, 1942, when uh, Israel Lichtenstein and these two teenagers were bearing the first cache of the archive. And they wrote their testimonies, and they all survived. And you see some of these testimonies on the walls of the Institute. And Israel Lichtenstein is saying, I've given my whole life to the archive. I don't ask for praise. I just want to be remembered. I want my wife, Gela Sextine, to be remembered. She designed stage sets for the children's theater. I want my daughter, Margalit, to be remembered. 20 months old, but equals four-year-olds in intelligence. And then he mentions teachers who could attest to that. And then he says, we, the Jews of Eastern Europe, are a redeeming sacrifice of the Jewish people. The Jewish people will survive. So in his last moments, Israel Lichtenstein reminds us that these were not anonymous, helpless victims. They fought for their right to be remembered as individuals, as people with a name, and as members of a proud and resilient nation. And, and that was the legacy of the Oynik Shabbos. Thank you.